Welcome everyone. What I've tried to do today uh, is put together um, some case law, tribunal cases, that hopefully covers different sectors of charity activities. So I wanted to try and talk about different areas that might impact most of you that are in this room in one way or another. I didn't want to focus on one particular area. So I'm trying to pick out case law um, where we'll talk about grants, we'll talk about land and property refurbishments, and then we'll look at some of the exemptions that apply to the charity sector. I'm then going to move on to some general updates, um, just to keep you updated as to what our friends at HMRC are doing. And then I'll look at things that are being introduced uh, in the new year, in particular, a new penalty regime, which I think you should all pay close attention to. So there are the areas I want to try and get through. I've got an hour and a half. Uh, hopefully I'll get through most of those, <laughs> all of them. If I don't manage to get through them, if we are having some drinks afterwards, we can touch base and ask any relevant questions. Uh, I feel advised that this is being recorded. Um, so therefore, if you are asking me any questions, bear in mind that that will be uh, on the recording. If there's questions after I've finished speaking and after the presentation, the recording will have stopped. Okay, so just to make you aware of it. OK, so let's start off with uh, some case law. And the first case I want to go through uh, is Colchester Institute Corporation, which is all about the VAT liability of what we call grant funding. Now, I remember this case from the point of view that it, it was released just before Christmas last year. And I nearly choked on my Christmas turkey when I read it. Um, let's go through the background. CIC is a college and it provides education to 16 to 19 year old students. Some of the students pay for the education themselves. Uh, others are partly funded by government funding. And revenues policy on government funding of this nature was it was always deemed to be outside the scope of VAT on the basis that it wasn't consideration for a supply. So as far as the college was concerned, this income wasn't liable to that. From a technical perspective, the provision of education in return for a fee falls specifically within the exemption schedule. So if an eligible body is providing education and it's getting paid for it, ordinarily that falls within the education exemption. And so as far as the college was concerned, it had two types of activity, non-business activity and exempt educational activity. Now back in 2008, the college undertook a major campus development. And as you can see, it was quite a, a costly project, 100 million. And it applied what was called the Lenarts mechanism. I don't know how many of you remember Lenarts. Uh, it's been withdrawn now. Is that somebody trying to break in someone's doorbell? <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Lenarts. <laughs> what the Lenarts mechanism was, was that it's allowed organisations to recover the VAT they incurred on their non-business activity up front. And then they paid back to HMRC an element uh, of that VAT uh, in subsequent periods. So what the Lenarts mechanism did, it gave you a cash flow benefit. You recovered all your VAT up front on the basis of your non-business use. And then over a period of time, based on that non-business use, you paid money back to HMRC. So it gave you a cash flow benefit. In 2014, uh, Colchester took some advice and they submitted a retrospective claim the VAT they paid over under Lenarts. The advice that they'd got was that the funding, the government funding that they received, wasn't actually grant funding, it was third party consideration for the provision of education. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if you're being paid for the provision of education, that's a business activity. So what the college was arguing was Lenarts should never have applied. We should never have had to account for output tax under Lenarts. They submitted their claim to revenue and at the same time um, they said to revenue well we've overpaid output tax however you can't assess us for the input tax because the input tax that we recovered right at the beginning was more than four years old classic case of wanting your cake and eat it by the sounds of it unsurprisingly revenue rejected the claim so uh, the college appealed went to the first tier tribunal and the tribunal agreed with revenue that this was grant funding, the education was a non-business activity. The college appealed further, went to the upper tribunal. And rather surprisingly, the upper tribunal found in favour of the college. The upper tribunal agreed with the college that the 
so-called grant funding it was getting was actually third party consideration for the provision of education and so therefore was exempt. So because that was exempt, that meant that the college didn't have to account for VAT under Lenarts. The next question then was, well, Revenue said, well, if there's no output tax due, then surely you can't have your input tax. So the, the uh, upper tribunal considered that and they found in favour of revenue because there is specific VAT legislation that isn't subject to the four year cap that says that if there's been a mistake, you have to take into consideration the full element of the mistake. So you can't have a situation where you're not accounting for output tax, but we can't assess you for input tax. So, and for those of you that want to look at the technical part of that, that's section 81.3 of the legislation. <laughs> Uh, so we had a situation, there was no output tax due under Lenarts and therefore no entitlement to input tax. So ultimately, this whole case went all the way to the upper tribunal um, and the college didn't win. However, the big problem for the sector is the potential implications of this case, because suddenly we now have a situation where we've got an upper tribunal decision, which of course is binding, unlike first tier tribunal. This is an upper tier tribunal decision that's saying that what we thought was grant funding isn't actually a grant, it's third party consideration for the provision of services to the students. And that could have, that if it, stood in, if it stays in place, could have huge ramifications for the charity sector. If you think about the zero rate release for the construction of new buildings, yeah, ordinarily those new buildings might be grant funded or the organisation might be grant funded. If this is right, potentially you lose your zero rating. The issue of zero rate certificates for fuel and power, yeah, based on non-business charitable use, again, you could lose that. Impact on school academies, yeah, who receive refunds uh, from government uh, of their VAT they incur because they're grant funded organisations. What are the implications? Thankfully, during the summer, revenue eventually got round to issuing a business brief. Okay, and in their business brief, they said that further litigation is going to be taking place regarding this very point, whether or not the upper tribunal is actually correct in treating uh, this funding as being payment, third party payment for consideration of services. And what they said is taxpayers can continue to rely on revenue's current policy. And so at the moment we're safe. I don't know what's going to happen or what the cases are that they're going to take uh, to be litigated further. Um, but clearly something that we need to keep an eye on because this could have huge implications. I think it's the first time I ever remember an upper tribunal decision effectively being put to one side by HMRC and say, oh, we see it binding, we're going to ignore that. Our policy is this is grant funding. Yeah, quite surprising that Revenue have taken that decision, but I think it would have been a bombshell to the charity sector if, that, if they didn't uh, do what they've done. So that was Colchester. Uh, next case for those of you in the cultural sector in the cultural exemption is the Royal Opera House. Okay, now, in the past, revenue always took the view that when a theatre uh, incurred VAT on production costs, or if a, a gallery incurred VAT on its, on its exhibition costs, those production costs, i.e., the costs of putting the show together, are directly related to the grant of admission. And so, therefore, if your ticket sales were exempt, you couldn't recover the VAT on your production costs. That policy changed back in 2009, following the Mayflower Theatre and Garsington Opera case. And again, Revenue issued a business brief uh, setting out what their policy was. And their policy was that um, if you're incurring production costs or exhibition costs, we accept that you can treat that VAT as partly recoverable. But what we don't accept is that you can use the standard method to work out how much of that VAT you can recover. And again, just a little reminder, the standard method is based on taxable income divided by taxable plus exempt income. Revenue took the view that using that kind of method is distortive, okay, because you're including things in there that have actually no link to your production costs. So what organisations were doing was including things like bar and catering income in that calculation. And revenue said, well, that doesn't have anything to do with the production, so why should you be able to use that turnover to increase the percentage of VAT you can recover? A case called Chester Zoo came along, which was all about the upkeep of the animals, 
Um, and Chester Zoo succeeded in the tribunal in arguing that their exhibition costs should be partly recoverable and that their catering income could be included in the calculation. Based on that decision uh, and a couple of other cases, uh, Royal Opera House said, well, actually, we think that we should be able to keep our bar and catering income in our calculation. And they submitted a claim to, to HMRC. OK, they argued that the standard method override doesn't apply. I'm sorry, I should have said that when you're using the standard method, if the amount of VAT involved is more than £50,000 and the difference is more than £50,000, something called the standard method override kicks in, which means you don't use the standard method to work out how much VAT you can recover, you use an alternative method. Okay, so Royal Opera House said, actually, the standard method override doesn't apply. We should be able to use just that standard method, taxable divided by taxable plus exempt, to work out the proportion of production costs we can recover. Obviously, revenue said no, as they normally do when there's a retrospective claim. They appealed to the tribunal, and the first tier tribunal found in its favour. Okay, Royal Opera House argued that there was a direct and immediate link between the production costs and the bar and catering income. What you effectively had was them arguing what you should be looking at is the economic use and the e economic use of the income that we're generating from our bar and catering, because that income is actually used to subsidise our production costs. In turn, the production costs attract customers to the restaurant and the bar. So we've got this virtuous circle of one feeding the other. Okay. They succeeded in the first tier tribunal with that argument. Revenue appealed to the upper tribunal. Unfortunately for them, the upper tribunal took a very, very, if you read the case, it's a very long case, and the upper tribunal took a detailed review of the case law. And having looked at all the case law, they concluded actually there's two alternative bases for establishing whether or not there's a direct link. Uh, what revenue said is that when you look at your general running costs, your general overheads, there's a right to VAT recovery on the basis of the direct and immediate link to the taxpayer's economic activity as a whole. Okay, so when you're looking at overheads, you're OK looking at the economic activities of the organisation as a whole. However, where you're looking at costs that are directly attributable to a particular supply, such as the sale of tickets, these are residual costs. And what you have to be able to demonstrate is that the costs associated with, your, with those supplies are somehow cost components of that final supply. And because of that, uh, they lost in the upper tribunal. Okay, in the, in the hearing itself, both, rev, both Revenue and the Royal Opera House agreed that the production costs were residual costs, not overhead costs. The case was appealed further to the Court of Appeal, and unfortunately, uh, the Court of Appeal agreed with the upper tribunal. So ultimately, Royal Opera House lost their appeal. So what that means for them in practice is when they're looking at what proportion of their production costs they can recover, they can't use the standard method. What they've got to do is apply a sectorised method. And the sectorised method that most cultural bodies use is show-related income divided by show-related and exempt tickets paid to get to a percentage. So if, for example, you're selling programmes, if you're selling CDs, if you've got particular shows or exhibitions that are sponsored, that's related to that particular activity skirt, so it can go into the calculation. Whereas bar and catering income, as far as the courts are concerned, has got nothing to do with your production costs. You know, when you're buying the costumes, what's the link between the costumes and the sale of a glass of champagne is effectively what was asked in the tribunal. Now, I'm aware Revenue have taken their time with this, uh, but I'm aware that they're targeting reviewing the sector. And the reason I'm, I'm saying I'm aware of this is I've had two galleries recently who have had letters from Revenue, um, and they seem to be template letters, because in the letters they're asking them about production costs. And I'm thinking, well, these are bloody galleries and museums. Why are you asking about production costs? So it's quite clear they're topping and tailing letters and sending them out on a fishing expedition. Okay, so if you're involved in this sector, uh, please have a look at how you're recovering VAT on your exhibition costs and your production costs and make sure it's in line with current case law. Okay, if you're doing it wrong, you're better off going to revenue yourselves rather than revenue identifying it because we know that in those circumstances, that's now an undisclosed error and potentially you'll have penalties. Okay, so please review what you're doing. 
I'll move on to a land and property case now. Uh, Balhousie, Balhousie, I don't know how you pronounce it, but how we want to pronounce it. Um, Balhousie Holding, Holdings. They issued a zero rate certificate for the construction of a new building that was going to be used for a relevant residential purpose. And if you issue, if you're going to construct a brand new building, you issue a certificate. And when you look at the terms of that certificate, there's a condition on there that you're going to carry on using that building uh, for a relevant residential purpose for a period of 10 years. This, if there's any change of use, or if there's a disposal of that building, then there's a clawback of the VAT that was originally zero rated. And the clawback is calculated based on how far down that 10 year period you've made the disposal or made the change. Now, our housey entered into a sell and leaseback arrangement to try and raise funds. And so they sold the freehold of their building and took back uh, something like a 999 year lease or a long lease in respect of the property. HMRC came along and said, aha, you've disposed of your entire interest in that building. Therefore, you've triggered the change of use provisions. A case went to tribunal, went to the courts, eventually ended up in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, thankfully, disagreed with revenue. Okay, what they said was that under a sell and leaseback arrangement, our housing holdings always had some kind of interest in that building and was able to carry on using that building. Although it had sold the freehold, it was only for a split second in time it had a, a lease come back instantly and therefore carried on using it. So therefore, why should the change of use provisions apply? So that was a good decision, okay? And obviously that applies not just for relevant residential buildings, but relevant charitable buildings, which is why it's important for the charity sector. Again, Revenue eventually issued a brief and you can tell that begrudgingly they don't like this decision just from the terms of their brief. Okay, they put down some conditions there and I'm not going to run through them because I'm conscious of time, but when you look at those conditions, uh, there's nothing in there that says this is necessarily what you had to do in the decision itself. Revenue are, are trying to ring fence this decision, just the particular circumstances of our housing. Okay. So although they put these conditions down in their business brief, if you've got circumstances that fall slightly outside of this, please take some advice and please ask somebody to review your particular circumstances. Okay, because I think the main point that's come out of this decision is if you can demonstrate that actually you're still in occupation and you're still using that building, why should the change of use provisions kick in? Right, United Grand Lodge of England. Freemasons. Uh, this case concerned the subscriptions paid by members and whether those subscriptions uh, fell within a specific exemption, which is in Schedule 9 of Group 9. If you look at that part of, of the Act, there's a list of various organisations uh, who can benefit from exempting their membership subscriptions. Okay, I've listed them out there. You've got trade unions, professional associations, learned societies, representational trade associations, and then this last one, is what uh, Grand Lodge relied on. Other public interest bodies, and these are bodies with main objects and aims that are in the public domain and are of a patriotic, religious, sorry, political, religious, patri patriotic, philosophical, philanthropic, or civic nature. Put my teeth in a minute and mention Peggy P. Um, but <laughs> so there's a particular section of uh, membership organization that can benefit from the exemption. Now, Grand Lodge claimed that its sole main aim was philosophical in nature, or in the alternative, the main aims taken together were philosophical, philanthropic, or civic nature, and therefore, and it did not have any other main aims. It's tried to argue those were the main aims. Now, the judge looked at all the evidence and he wasn't satisfied that the charitable work of individual Freemasons, such as volunteering to give time to local charities, were undertaken by them as Freemasons. He was effectively saying this is something that you're doing out of the goodness of your hearts, not because this is an objective of the Freemasons. He agreed that UGLE did have aims of philosophical, philanthropic and civic nature, 
i.e. the promotion of all aspects and practice of Freemasonry, and that the charity was central to its activities. However, it didn't accept that that was UGLE's main aim and its main objective. And because of that, uh, decided that actually its membership subscriptions were liable to that, didn't fall within the exemption. Okay, it's quite a small point what your main aims are, but it just goes to show the detail that you have to go to to try and determine whether or not you fall within one of these exemptions. You know, the starting point is always to look at your aims and objectives, see what your members and arts say. Okay, that's your starting point, and then compare that to what the legislation says. Again, in terms of the evidence, um, he looked and he saw that at least 48% of payments that were given out by Grand Lodge actually went to Freemasons and their dependents. Okay, and uh, that was the reason why I said that remained one of their main aims, i.e. to support other Freemasons and their dependents and their families. And then finally, he looked at whether there was any evidence that indicated that they had a civic aim. And again, they couldn't be said to be an organisation that has aims pertaining to the citizen and the state. And so again, that's another reason why they, they lost. OK, that was an exemption regarding membership subs. I want to look at another exemption now, uh, and this is the provision of vocational training and services closely related to vocational training. Step by step Northern Ireland. Okay, so step by step is a charity. What does it do? Well, it provides vocational training in hospitality to students with learning difficulties. And it, it ran a restaurant which was staffed by both students uh, and teachers. It's open to the public and the idea that it's open to the public is so that the students can get practical experience of what it's like to run a restaurant. And so the whole purpose of it was to support the educational activity of, of the charity. And it was run on a non-profit making basis. Okay? It wasn't there to generate any surpluses. It was literally there just to support the education uh, of these uh, students with learning difficulties. Now, Step by Step had a contract with another college. And, and the contract was to provide training to the students of those college. Uh, and it was also responsible for the recruitment of students to this particular training program. Step by Step registered for VAT back in 2011. And I don't know whether it took advice or looked at the legislation itself, but having looked at the legislation, um, it was considered that actually those services that it was providing from the restaurant should actually be exempt. Okay, it's been accounting for VAT. When people went and sat, Joe Public went and sat in the restaurant, they were receiving catering, and so because they were back registered, they were accounting for VAT on that. Having looked and considered this further, they actually took the view that those supplies were closely related to the provision of education. So therefore, why is this not exempt? So they, they said, we're going to deregister and applied to revenue to, to deregister on the basis of the exemption. And this is the section of legislation they relied on. Okay. Group six of Schedule nine, a provision by an eligible body. And we know that that includes a charity, ordinary it's a university, college or school, but it also includes a charity. So the provision of education by a charity of educational vocational training, that's item one, where they fall within that. The legislation they were relying on was item four, a supply of any goods or services which are closely related. Ah, there we go, look, I've got a little toy. Uh, which are closely related to the supply of a description falling within item one i.e. closely related to vocational training. By or to the eligible body making the principal supply, provided that the goods and services are for the direct use of the pupil, student or trainee receiving the principal supply. Well, what we had here was one charity, an eligible body, providing educational services to a college, another eligible body, for the benefit of their students. So therefore, item four should apply. Goods are closely related, services are closely related to the provision of education. They argued it was a business activity and that the supplies from the uh, restaurant were closely related and essential to the provision of education vocational training. And they referred to the 
European Court judgment of Brockenhurst College, where there was this exact finding. Now, I took a step back when I was reading this, and I thought, well, why are Revenue arguing this case? It seems to be on, on all fours with Brockenhurst. Where Revenue were coming from, rather sneakily, I think, <laughs> was that they tried to argue that because this restaurant wasn't run on, I suppose, an economic basis, it wasn't there to make any profits or surpluses, Revenue tried to argue that that was a non-business activity. Now, you may say, well, what's the significance of that? The significance of that is if it's a non-business activity, you can't rely on item four. Okay, because item four only applies if you've got goods or services closely related to the provision of education. And it's the provision of paid education. Okay, so if you've got the provision of free education, your restaurant can't be closely related or essential to the provision of a non-business activity. So that's where revenue were coming from here. Now, the first tier tribunal referred to the case of Colchester College, which I spoke about right at the beginning. And what it found was there was clearly a supply for consideration, i.e. there was the provision of catering in the restaurant and those people that turned up paid a consideration for it. The college was, was paying, S, the uh, college that was using SBS was paying the college for its services. And so therefore SBS was undertaking an economic activity. It also found that the main purpose of the restaurant was to enable students to get their work experience. And therefore, because this was a business activity and it was a service closely related to education, the exemption applied. Demonstrates what arguments revenue will try to use just to try and uh, say no. Okay, so surprising that they took this, but it seems to contradict some of their other, other case law and arguments that they've taken, but this is how they try to argue this particular one. Okay, Cambridge University Boathouse. And now moving you into the sports exemption. <laughs> so we've done the cultural exemption, we've done the educational exemption, we'll now look at sport. Cambridge University Boathouse. Uh, by its name, it owns a, a boathouse which it licenses to three Cambridge University boat clubs. And what the boat clubs do is uh, field crews for the annual boat race with Oxford. Cambridge sought to recover the VAT in respect of the running of the boathouse. Okay, it was arguing that the uh, fees that it was charging from the boathouse are standard rated. The claim for VAT recovery was rejected by revenue on the basis that revenue believed its services fell within the sporting exemption. And again, there's a specific exemption for the provision of sport. Okay, bedtime reading for you, group nine, item three. The supply, and there's that phrase again, the supply by an eligible body to an individual, remember that phrase, that term, individual, of services closely linked with and essential to sport or physical education in which the individual is taking part. Okay, so where you're providing sports services to an individual, uh, that can fall within the exemption. Now, it was accepted by revenue that the Cambridge University Boathouse was an eligible body. And it was also accepted that the supplies were closely related to the provision of sport. However, the supplies from the boathouse were made to three clubs. Again, I don't know how many of you remember, but there was a case, an ECJ case involving Canterbury hockey, where the question before the court was whether or not when sports services are supplied to clubs, can those uh, services be exempt? Okay, because if you go back to what the legislation talks about, it talks about individuals. And so the question in Canterbury hockey was, does the exemption also apply to clubs? And so the question for the uh, ECJ was, who are the true beneficiaries of those services? And in that particular case, it was found that the true beneficiaries were the individual members of the clubs and therefore the sporting exemption applied. If we now convert that and apply that to what we have here, the question for the tribunal was to determine whether the beneficiary were the rowers themselves or the clubs that were renting out the, uh, the boathouse. In my mind, rather surprisingly, 
the first tier tribunal found that it was the clubs that had the right to use the boathouse. They paid for it. They stored the equipment there. The rowers had no right of access and therefore the exemption didn't apply. And so they've now created a very thin dividing line. <laughs> okay, when is a supply to a club for the benefit of an individual? And when actually is it, where does it, does it stop and say, well, actually the individual doesn't get any of the benefit of this, it's just for the club. And I, I don't know what the answer is. It'd be interesting to see whether revenue appealed this one. This is a very, very recent case. This literally came out about three or four weeks ago. So it will be interesting to see if this one's appealed further. Okay, because certainly when you look at the Canterbury decision in isolation, you'd have thought, well, actually the individuals are benefiting here. In this particular instance, the tribunal has found in favour uh, of the club who wanted standard rating in this instance. Okay, so there's a bit of doubt as to how far we go with the sporting exemption. Right, one final case. I think that's the final case I'm going to talk about. Uh, and it's actually one of our clients, a Buzzercock client, which is why I haven't got a name up there for you, unfortunately. And the reason I haven't got a name up there is because we haven't had a decision yet. <laughs> but I can outline the facts for you. So we have a client who provides hostel accommodation uh, for, for homeless persons. And the people that stay at this hostel have a license agreement. And under the terms of that license agreement, the individuals are allowed to stay there anything between six to 12 months. And nine times out of 10, that these persons are homeless, they need support, they need help. In some instances, there are supporting people contracts in place where there's actual welfare provided as part of the accommodation. Now, revenue initially said that the accommodation that was provided in this hostel in fact, there's a number of hostels, but in this particular one they picked on, uh, they said that the services were exempt on the basis that the accommodation was ancillary to the provision of welfare. Again, for those of you that don't know, there's a specific exemption there that co covers the provision of welfare services to elderly, sick or distressed persons when provided by an eligible body. There's that phrase again, eligible body. Okay, that includes a charity. Okay, so revenue initially said, your accommodation is ancillary to the provision of welfare, so therefore it's exempt. They then came back a year and a half later and said, actually, we believe this is standard rated on the basis that the hostel accommodation is similar to hotel stroke similar accommodation, so therefore it's standard rated. Revenue went away and then they came back again and said, actually, we still think this is standard rated, but we don't think it's standard rated on the basis that it's because it's an exclusion to the land exemption. We believe it's standard rated because it's a supply of facilities. So I thought, well, what, what's the difference? Where are they coming from here? Why have they suddenly distinguished? And I'll explain why they distinguished. Okay, but first of all, let's look at what the legislation says. So the legislation exempts the grant of any interest or right over land, unless of course you've opted to tax, but let's park that for a minute. So ordinarily, the grant of an interest in land is exempt, other than, and there you've got a specific exclusion there, other than the provision in a hotel, inn, boarding house, or similar establishment of sleeping accommodation. Okay, so if you've got hostel or hotel accommodation, the supply is standard rated because it's specifically excluded from that part of the exemption schedule. Now, revenue argued, that the agreement didn't convey a grant of an interest in land or license to occupy to the individual and therefore it's a, a supply of facilities. So why is that important? Because in both cases the supply is standard rated. The reason it's important, and again I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but there's a special rule there for the provision of hotel accommodation. Where you have hotel accommodation that spans a 28-day period, there's a provision in VAT legislation that allows you to account for VAT on a reduced value after the 28th day. Okay, when someone has stayed in a hotel for more than 28 days, after 28 days on the 29th day, there is no VAT liability on the accommodation. You only pay VAT for any other ancillary services you're getting. So the important point for this case, and the important point for my client, was if revenue are right, and this is a supply of facilities, 
we can't benefit from the 28 day rule. Whereas if we're right and we think this is actually a license to occupy and therefore falls within the exemption schedule and falls within one of the exclusions to the exemption, then we can use a 28 day rule. The case was heard in March. And actually, it was an online case heard next door. I turned it into a mini courtroom. <laughs> I had tax counts on the witness here uh, and me and my admin support and IT support, making sure things didn't collapse. <laughs> and we were here for three days um, going through the case. And uh, yeah, re revenue were there. And it was interesting because the two revenue officers that were there, I don't know how they did it, but they put their lighting in such a way that we couldn't make out what they looked like. <laughs> All I saw was silhouettes. <laughs> OK, I could hear them, but I couldn't see them. <laughs> but anyway, the case was heard here back in March and, and the judge. Um, well, let's go through what they, what they were relying on, first of all. First of all, revenue were relying on the fact that the license agreement, when you looked at it, said that there was no landlord tenancy relationship created. And the agreement wasn't intended to confer exclusive occupation to the tenant. Well, that's standard, that's standard clauses. OK. Our clients argued that actually the residents had occupation of their own rooms. You know, they had their own front door key to every single bedroom. You know, they, they, nobody could go in there unless they opened the door and let them in, apart from if there's a, an emergency. But they had exclusivity. So we had both parties arguing that the supply was standard rated, but for different reasons. If revenue win this case, I think this would have big, big implications for the sector, because suddenly we're into what, what is a license to occupy? What kind of test do we have to apply? At the end of the hearing, the judge, and I'm not going to mention her name, but the judge said, I recognise the importance of this case. You'll get my decision within two months. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting. OK, I've sent in a letter to the tribunal and the first letter that went in was around about June, July. First letter said, uh, your comments have been brought to the attention of the judge. And I thought, oh God, oh, my career's over. I'm in trouble. <laughs> the second letter went in and it's not even been acknowledged. So I haven't a clue what's going on. And obviously you can imagine our client is getting more and more frustrated. Um, we've had cases after this last person, but there have been tribunal cases subsequent to this. There have been decisions coming out. I really don't understand what's going on here, but clearly one to keep, keep your eye on uh, when it's published. I'll let everybody know. Uh, I think it went well. I'll be very, very surprised if we lose. Um, but I think revenue are taking this as a test case, because as you'll see later on, I mentioned that they're reviewing the land and property exemptions. OK, and I think they were they were testing to see how far the, the tribunals are willing to go. Right, that's all I was going to say on tribunal cases. I've just got a quick slide where I've headed exemptions and planning. Now, why have I got that up there? You'll note that what I've tried to do with those first few cases there is touch on some of the exemptions that might apply to the charity sector. And we touched on all of those education, welfare services, cultural services, sporting services and membership subscriptions. And you'll notice that there's always a common thread. Whenever you're trying to benefit from one of these exemptions, there's always a common thread. And the common thread is, is the supplier an eligible body? Okay. Sometimes it doesn't use the phrase eligible body. Sometimes it uses the phrase non-profit making organisation. But that term eligible body has a different meaning in every single one of those schedules. Okay, Eligible body for the provision of education is completely different to eligible body for the provision of cultural services. Okay, so don't make the mistake of assuming that eligible body is the same thing. It's a different meaning depending on which element of the exemption schedule you're looking at. <coughs> the good news is if you fall within the exemption, you don't have to account for VAT on your income. The bad news, of course, is if you can't if you don't make taxable supplies, i.e. if your supplies are exempt, it means you can't recover VAT on your costs. Unless, of course, uh, the costs are lower than what I've called the, the partial exemption de minimis limits. And so if you've got exempt supplies, it's important to set your budgets properly. However, 
Is there an alternative? Yeah. Are you better breaking the exemption and making your supplies vatable? I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever considered that point, but sometimes you're better off charging VAT rather than treating your supplies as exempt. And there's two things that you need to consider there. First of all, the status of your customers, because obviously if you're charging VAT, your customers might not be too happy, not unless you keep your prices at the same level and you take the VAT hit yourselves. But if you've got customers who can recover the VAT, then you might be better off doing that, breaking the exemption. And a, and a classic uh, scenario of that is where you've got contracts with local authorities. Okay? So the area of welfare services, that's a classic one where lots of organisations have contracts with local, local authorities for the provision of welfare. If you break that exemption, and how do you break that exemption? Well, you have to be an eligible body. So the classic way of breaking that is to put those contracts into a trading subsidiary. Okay? Because the trading subsidiary is not an eligible body. Now, there's a lot of steps that you have to take to make sure that that stands up to scrutiny. But nevertheless, it's an option that's available to you. So I'll put a question on there, well, a statement on there. Consider the impact of standard rating versus exemption. Depending on which exemption you're looking at, what suits you best? You know, another area where this is very common for us to be asked to look at this is the cultural sector. Is a theatre better off with standard rating tickets? Or is it better off with exempt tickets? Same with education. If you put your educational activity through a trading subsidiary, it becomes standard rated. I'll use that phrase if you do it through a trading subsidiary. You need to make sure your trading subsidiary's got the wherewithal to be making the supply. So it needs to have staff, it needs to have premises, it needs to have all the ingredients you need to be able to demonstrate you're not just rooting things through a trading subsidiary. Yeah, so if you're going to do any of this kind of structuring, you need some careful planning. Okay, but just take a step back and think of those various exemptions that we went through there. They've all got different conditions and there's different ways of breaking all of them. Now, with the cultural sector, for example, you've got this phrase managed and administered on an essentially voluntary basis. Now, there you go, what does that mean? <laughs> it means if you put a paid trustee on the board, you're no longer managed and administered on an essentially voluntary basis, so therefore your supplies become standard rated. I had a classic example of this not long ago where unfortunately for the client they inadvertently put themselves back into the exemption without realizing it. Okay, because what happened with this particular client, uh, they set up their structure many 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 years ago and they had a paid trustee on the board and unfortunately that trustee passed away and nobody thought about VAT when the poor chap passed away and the impact that might have, but he passed away, so they were no longer managed, they now were managed and administered on a voluntary basis because that paid trustee was no longer breaking the exemption. Unfortunately for them, they had a major refurbishment. So now all their ticket sales were exempt. Although they got the VAT back on their ticket sales, they lost all the VAT on their capital project. Literally because they had inadvertently not realised that they've got themselves back into the exemption, having broke, taken steps to break it in the first place. So again, even with careful planning, please monitor regularly what your circumstances are. Right, some updates for you. Okay, so many of you would have done your annual adjustments, I hope, or your VAT recovery annual adjustments. And because of COVID, lots of you would have had skewed calculations. Okay, either your um, income has been more or less nil, or certain parts of your activities uh, may, have, may have been much reduced. So charities with charity shops, you've had reduced levels of taxable income because your charity shops have been closed. Museums, galleries, theatres, reduced tickets, bar, retail sales. Universities, their trading subsidiaries may not have been operating. We've got a complete mixed bag of implications here. Yeah, COVID has skewed the activities of many organisations. So that meant that lots of organisations had instances where their partial exemption annual adjustments were going to provide an odd result. And for many, many months, we kept saying to Revenue, what are we going to do about it? And eventually, 
they issued a revenue and customs brief, 4 of 21. And what they said in that brief was that they'll fast track approvals for temporary methods. Okay, and what they actually allowed organizations to do, uh, if you were finding that your annual adjustment was producing an odd result, they're allowing you to take the average of your previous two to three years normal trading. Okay, whatever that percentage was, use that as the basis of your annual adjustment. Okay, they also said that you could use estimated turnover if you were a newly registered business. If you're using the standard method, they said that they would allow you to use the override to make the adjustment. Okay, and what the override does, standard method override allows you to use any method based on use. There's no definition of that term use. What it means in practice is any method that produces fair and reasonable results. There was an alternative there. And helpfully, revenue also said that whatever adjustment you use under this fast track method, you also apply that to your capital goods scheme adjustments. Now, in practice, I know that revenue were very, very slow uh, in giving approvals for this. I know I've got one client in this room where we literally waited four months. However, when you do get approval, you'll note in the approval letter that there's an end date. Firstly, please make sure that you're making a note of what that end date might be, because as soon as this is a temporary approval, this isn't the right to be able to use the average of your previous two, three years recovery rates and just apply that for a never ending period. OK, there's, a, there's an end date on it. I don't know how many of you apply. Did, did many of you in this room apply for, for methods? No, you'll, you'll, I mean, some organisations have beneficial rates of recovery, I should say. They go, just how interesting, how odd is odd? How odd is odd? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I mean, I had one particular client, a university client, where their normal average recovery rate was 22%. And because of COVID, their recovery rate dropped to 14%. Okay, now, that doesn't sound huge. But in that terms, that cost them something like 220,000. We then had to do capital goods scheme adjustments, and that cost them another, I don't know how many hundred thousand, because they had a major development not long ago, 60 million pound development. So unfortunately for them, we applied to revenue for a temporary method. By the time revenue replied, it's time to do the VAT returns. So we had to take the hit. And then when revenue did eventually apply and said you can make adjustments, I then took ages to try and get anything out of revenue to confirm whether I could include that adjustment in the next VAT return or whether we had to submit a disclosure. And thankfully, revenue said just put it in the next VAT return. So then I thought, oh no, it's going to trigger a VAT inspection, but it didn't happen, thankfully. Okay. But it's really down to what your individual circumstances are. But this is there. Okay, which is helpful, can be helpful. Right, I'm not going to go into detail on the construction industry reverse charge, but I want to flag it. Okay, because the, you may be asked things like, are you an end user? If you've got a development project going on, uh, do you need to issue a letter to your con contractor stating that you're an end user? Because that's going to determine whether or not they charge you VAT. Now, the whole point of the construction industry reverse charge is to stop what revenue perceives to be missing trader fraud. Okay, they, they've reached the conclusion that there's lots of fraud in the construction sector. You've got contractor A supplying contractor B, supplying contractor C, and B disappears without paying the VAT when he's, when he's been paid by contractor C. So it's referred to as missing trader fraud. So to try and stop that, they've introduced what's called the reverse charge. And it applies to specified services between that registered entities and the definition they've decided to take is services that fall within the construction industry scheme. <coughs> As services supplied to an end user such as a property owner, this is when, sorry, reverse charge will apply to specified services unless the services are supplied to an end user. Okay, so if you're the organization that's benefiting from those services, you're not onward supplying them to another party. Okay, the reverse charge doesn't apply to you. However, if you're receiving those construction services and you're going to recharge them to another entity, not a connected entity, another entity, <coughs> then the reverse charge applies. 
And then there's a couple of other things. If you're not that registered, if the services are zero rated, um, then again, it doesn't apply. Now, the way it works is that when contractor A raises his invoice to contractor B, rather than the normal rule of charging them VAT, they won't charge that. Instead, there'll be a statement on the invoice saying, you're liable for the for the VAT under the reverse charge, which basically means that the recipient now charges himself VAT and then reclaims it subject to the normal rules. In other words, if they're using those services for an onward supply, they can recover the VAT. So it nets itself off. It goes in box one and it goes in box four, and there shouldn't be any impact. Okay, but I've put this on there because you may, if you if you're undertaking a construction project, you may be asked whether or not you're an end user. Okay, and similarly, there are some organisations that have their own design and build companies. Okay, and again, how does it affect them? Well, they're connected parties, so they're effectively end users. Okay, end of the temporary reduced rate. Again, if we cast our minds back to the height of COVID and everything else that was going on, there was a reduced rate introduced for admission to attractions, museums, galleries, theatres, zoos, holiday accommodation, the sale of food and non-alcoholic drink. They don't like alcohol, do they? Okay. <laughs> and the idea was to boost the tourism and hospitality sector. And we had the 5% applying from the 15th of July to the 30th of September. And now we've got 12.5% applying until the 31st of March. I've just put a bullet point on there. If payments are received before the 31st of March 2022 for events or supplies that are taking place after that date, 12.5% still applies. Okay, you're crystallizing a tax point. However, if your services are exempt in any event because you fall within the cultural exemption, for example, then that's what the situation is. The exemption applies. Some practical issues to consider. I can just put those up there for you when the VAT rate changes uh, next year. You may need to adapt your pricing structure to reflect the higher VAT rate. You may need to adapt your tills and accounting systems. Online booking engines, you need to consider. Your invoice templates, yeah, you need to change them from 12.5 to 20%. Ensure that the correct VAT rates are applied. What happens if a particular service straddles that or VAT return straddles the 31st of March period? Okay, these are all practical issues that you need to think about. Okay, so start preparing in advance for those. And let's hope the VAT rate does stay at 20%. <laughs> okay, online conferences. Again, this is uh, an area that's caused me. Uh, quite a lot of grief, literally, because I can't find a clear answer from HMRC. Uh, however, I've given you what our opinion is on here, uh, literally because we've had lots of organisations moving towards online conferences, and therefore they want to know what the VAT implications are. So ordinarily, if you've got admission to a conference, let's say you're holding a conference uh, in Paris, uh, and you've got admission to that conference, the place of supply is where the event takes place which nine times out of 10 means that you've got to register for VAT in France. However, because of where we are and all the problems we've had, uh, we've had lots of organisations organising virtual events. Now, if you're organising a virtual event, there's three things you need to consider from a VAT perspective. What's the nature of the service provided? What's the place of supply for VAT purposes? And what's the status of your customer? Okay, they're the three initial questions you need to think about. If what you have is actually an electronically supplied service, so a digital type service, okay, and a classic example of that is a recorded event, not a live event, but a recorded event, that's going to fall within the electronically supplied service uh, condition. And what you normally have with that is minimal human intervention. You know, with a, with a recorded event, you're not going to have somebody presenting and somebody listening like we're doing here. We're going to be going back to what the webinars I was trying to do earlier. Okay. But you know, where you've got an electronically supplied service, you've got a different set of rules. Okay. The place of supply there is where you've got B2B, business to business. It's in the customer's country. So if it's the UK, it's liable to that. 
it's outside of the UK, it's going to be outside the scope of UK VAT, but there might be a reverse charge on the customer. If it's a consumer, again, UK VAT, and there could also be an overseas VAT registration. And the reason I put overseas VAT registration on there is because we're aware that lots of countries have got a different definition of what a digital service is. And Spain is a classic example. I know Spain have got a completely different definition of what constitutes a digital service to what we have. So if you're involved in an, in an electronic service, uh, please try and find out what the rules are in the country of receipt. OK, but let's say we've got a live event where we've got some active participation between speakers and delegates. What's the place of supply? The other thing you need to consider, is it the provision of education? And there, again, the reason I've put that up there is this is where I find revenues guidance unclear, I suppose is, is the way to describe it, because if you look at their guidance, uh, for some reason, they give an example of a consultancy service as including education. And I don't know how they reached that conclusion because there's been case law that indicates that's not the case. And so there's, I've been trying to get clarity from HMRC, uh, but unfortunately, nobody's, nobody's home, nobody's answering me. <laughs> okay. So the view that we're taking is it's, if you've got a live event, it's not a digital service, so therefore the general rule applies. However, when you apply the general rule, there is a specific exception for the provision of education when supplied to a consumer. So when you're supplying education to a consumer, i.e. an individual, the place of supply is where the education is supplied, where the event is taking place. So you need to look at where is that uh, supplier established. That's okay, so where we've got B2B UK customers. Obviously UK that applies. B2B overseas customers would be outside the scope of VAT. You would expect a reverse charge to apply in the customer's country. However, depending on which country you're dealing with, you may have an overseas VAT registration. If you've got B2C UK consumer, again, UK VAT applies unless it's supplied by an eligible body and it's the provision of education, in which case it's exempt. If it's B2C overseas consumer, again, UK VAT will apply. Okay, don't make the don't fall into the trap of treating it as outside the scope. The only time it would be outside the scope is if what revenue are saying is right that actually education is somehow consultancy. I'm not sure that's that's the case, but as I say we've written to HMRC to try and get clarity and we're not getting anything. Again, unless the supplier is an eligible body, in which case the exemption applies. And then just a note: not all countries use the same definition. OK, so if you're doing some online conferences, I think it's an area to take some advice. <laughs> right, I'm going to get on my soapbox now. <laughs> HMRC delays. Right, there are a number of areas uh, where for the past, I don't know, 12 months seem to seem to be getting from bad to worse. Uh, I, I suppose I'm going to show my age now. <laughs> I've been dealing with that for 35 years now. <laughs> and I think this is the worst I've ever known it, I have to say. Certainly in my days as a, a VAT officer, uh, we had an office and people could come to the front inquiry desk, sit down in front of us, ask us the question, and we would give them an answer. Whether they liked it or not was a different matter, but nevertheless, we ran an inquiry desk when I was a VAT officer. Now we can't find anyone to speak to. VAT groups, okay, if you're thinking of applying for a VAT group registration, please make your application sooner rather than later because we've reached a situation at the moment where clients are applying for a VAT group and revenue have got a huge backlog. They're just not answering. Um, I attended a property conference two weeks ago where we had someone from revenue policy there and we asked them the question. We said, look, the delays are taking so long that our clients are now having to submit their existing VAT return because they don't know whether they've got approval for their VAT group. Because what happens is if you've got an existing VAT registration and you apply for a VAT group registration with a, a subsidiary, you're issued with a new VAT number. 
to your existing VAT number becomes redundant. Revenue are taking so long to reply that the VAT return becomes due and the client doesn't know whether to submit the VAT return, ignore the VAT return, or charge VAT to the subsidiaries trying to group with. And we asked a guy from policy, what should we do? And he said, well, you should re rec record those transactions and file your VAT return. We said, strange that, but the officers that we've been speaking to have been telling us the exact opposite. So we don't know what's happening. Okay, but if you're applying for a VAT group, just be wary that revenue are taking forever to come back to you. Similarly with deregistrations. Okay, if you're applying to deregister your organisation, again, revenue are taking forever to come back and you don't know whether to file your VAT return or not. The only thing I can suggest to you, if you've applied to deregister and you're no longer trading, then file the all returns. Okay, but again, they're taking an age to come back. Applications to register, same issue. Option to tax. That one is a huge issue, and I'm going to show you a slide at the moment where revenue are, uh, again, trying to help the sector. But that's, that potentially is a big, big problem, the option to tax. Because the option to tax determines whether or not you charge VAT on your rental income. But more importantly, uh, you have situations where one business is taking over the, the, the activities of another and you're trying to structure so that you've got what's called a transfer of a going concern. And one of the conditions for a transfer of a going concern involving property is that both the seller and the purchaser have exercised their option to tax. Now, if the purchaser has opted to tax and you can't provide the evidence to prove that, because revenue are taking months, what does it do to the transaction? Revoking the option. After a period of 20 years, you can revoke your option for tax. Again, I've got one particular client. <laughs> they revoked their option. Their only transaction is with um, a college where they've opted to tax and they're charging VAT on the rent. And they decided they want to revoke the option because it's more than 20 years since they opted. And once they've revoked that option, they don't have any other taxable income they'll be able to deregister. They'll be saving the money, uh, saving the college some money. They revoked their option back in August. We heard nothing. So I thought, OK, let's apply to deregister. Okay, but caveat that heavily, because obviously if you deregister with a taxable asset on hand at the time of deregistration, i.e. your opted property, you could crystallise a VAT liability. So we put a letter together, we applied to deregister, absolutely nothing. The client is now saying to me, I've got a VAT return to do. What am I going to put on my VAT return? And again, the only thing I can advise them is to put a nil return in. Submit the return, but put nil. Hopefully, that might trigger some action from HMRC. <laughs> Why are you suddenly putting in nil returns? Let's ask some questions. But these are the frustrations we're facing. Voluntary disclosures. I've got two clients who have submitted quite large disclosures to revenue more than four or five months ago. No contact from HMRC, no assessments raised by HMRC, absolutely nothing. Client is asking, well, what do we do? We owe revenue money. Applications for non-statutory clearance. That's what I've tried to do with the online conferences. I think our letter went off back in June. Boris, are you there? <laughs> no answer. <laughs> I think there's a I think there's a, a mixture of reasons. I think COVID hasn't helped. Uh, I didn't want to get onto Brexit. I've got, if you've noticed, I haven't done anything on Brexit, but I don't think that's helped because obviously officers have been moved to customs duties. Um, there's been lots of relocation of offices. So the registration units in Wolverhampton and the back group registration units in Grimsby have both been disbanded. Uh, some officers didn't want to relocate, they don't have the expertise to deal with it, so they've got a huge backlog of training officers to learn what they're supposed to be doing. So there's a lack of expertise, there's a lack of knowledge, there's all sorts of reasons why this is happening, but it's no good to the taxpayer. Now, you as our clients want certainty, and I'm standing here telling you I can't give you certainty. Yeah, there's lots of instances where we're having to take what I call a, a risk-based approach. You know, what's the worst case scenario? Let's try and mitigate it as far as we can. 
The one thing I, I would advise, urge you to do is if you're sending emails to revenue, uh, tick the box for a delivery receipt and a read receipt. Okay, so at least you've got a record that you've done something. Yeah, the ones that I've sent, the letters that we've sent, we've done them recorded delivery. The revocation of the option to tax, I know it was read by an officer four weeks after we sent it in, so I've got a read receipt. But nothing's happened. <laughs> it took them four weeks to read it and then months of inaction. Same with the application to deregister. The read receipt sprung up that somebody's read it and I got all excited thinking oh, we're getting out somehow. Nothing. Okay, option to tax. Okay, I said earlier that there's a this could create a problem, particularly where you've got transfers of a going concern. Revenue have tried to help. You know, the property conference I went on a couple of weeks ago, uh, the chap there from policy reminded us that there's supposedly a fast track way of getting your option to tax through, and they've requested what well, they call it priority route in place. Okay. Priority route in place to enable revenue to deal with the most urgent cases. But they've asked for specific information. So in addition to the information on the option to tax, this is the additional information they want. OK, so I've put that in there in the slides that you've got it. OK, hopefully by submitting this information, you might get an answer. <coughs> this is what we've been told. Whether it works in practice, I've not tested it yet. Okay, but this is supposedly a fast track way of trying to get a reply. Four, not bad. Okay, looking ahead. Okay, looking ahead, things that we need to look out for next year. New penalty regime, penalty and interest regime coming in on the first of April. I'm going to go into a bit of a couple of slides on that one in a moment because it's an important point. And if you want to go into the detail, you probably need to sit down with a cold towel over your head because it's horrendously complicated. But I've tried to summarize what the main points are. Simplifying the land exemption. Yeah, there's been a review going on about how they can try and simplify the way the option to tax works. Um, I'll put on some, again, I've got a slide outlining some of the points there. There was a call for evidence with regard to changing the partial exemption de minimis limits and changing the capital goods scheme threshold. Okay, that was back in 2019. Uh, there's whispers that we might get something next year. Okay, so something to look out for because the de minimis limit of seven and a half thousand, I think, has been at that level for well, a very, very long time. Okay, so that might increase, that might be good news for the sector. The capital goods scheme threshold. Again, it's been at 250,000 for a very, very long time. There's talk that could increase to a million. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But again, something to keep an eye on. The value shifting consultation. I don't know how many of you were aware this was going on. Um, but Rowley published a document saying they were looking at the way that uh, organisations were valuing their supplies. And what they had in mind uh, was mainly things like retailers where I don't know if you remember, probably about a year ago, you had uh, Marks and Spencer saying uh, you had a 10 pound, 10 pound food pack where you could buy, buy some food and you get a bottle of wine all for 10 pounds. And the food is zero rated, obviously the wine is standard rated. And I don't know what MS were doing in terms of the valuation, but clearly it's triggered something in revenue's mind. <laughs> okay. uh, similarly, where, where could that affect the charity sector? Well, if you're running a membership organization, I know that some membership organisations are portioned their subscriptions between either standard rated and exempt benefits and the zero rated publication. And now the, the historic way of valuing the publication has always been to look at the costs, to consider the costs involved in supplying that publication. The consultation was moving away from that, and the idea of the consultation was to come up with a different method of calculating how you do that apportionment. As I say, it's been suspended at the moment, but again, you never know when it's going to re resurrect itself, but one to look out for. I didn't want to use the B word today, but full import procedures from 1st of January 2022. And we've had a year of being able to use a, a system where you, you can suspend putting in your customs entry when you're bringing goods into the UK um, to a later date. From 1st of January next year, 
unless you put your customs entry in at the time you're bringing your goods in, your goods aren't going to be released. Okay, so if you're reporting goods, please have a look at what the new requirements might be. Making tax digital. At the moment, we operate on the basis that if you're back registered, but your turnover is below the uh, compulsory VAT registration threshold, you don't have to use MTD. That's changing from 1st of April next year. All VAT registered entities must submit their VAT returns using compatible software under MTD. And looking ahead, I might get my tribunal decision. I, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> might get it before Christmas. That'd be a nice Christmas present from Santa. Anyway. OK, so. The penalty regime. I've got five minutes. OK. Uh, new, new regime is going to come in 1st of April 2022. And the first and, and this isn't with regard to errors. This is with regard to submitting back returns and late payments. OK. So late payment penalty, late payment penalties are supposedly the new late payment penalties are built around the idea that the sooner you pay, the lower the penalty. Uh, the first penalty is going to be a set percentage of the outstanding balance up to day 30. And the guidance currently says that's going to be fixed at 2%. If after day 30 you still haven't paid, then a second penalty is going to be calculated. And that's going to be at 4%. If you put your hands up and say to Revenue, look, we need to agree some kind of time to pay arrangement, uh, then the penalty charges may result in them being suspended. <laughs> My concern is, is are we going to be able to find anyone in Revenue to speak to to negotiate a payment plan? But that's a different question, I suppose. Uh, HMRC will notify the taxpayer of both penalties, so whether you've got 2% or 4%, and you can appeal the penalty uh, to the tribunal. As well as a late payment penalty, there's a new late submission penalty. Five minutes left before it. What happens? Does it is it like Mission Impossible? The machine just goes. <laughs> okay. Uh, new late submission penalty. When a taxpayer misses his submission deadline, you're going to incur a penalty point. What are the points, mate? Uh, um, points, will be points will be received for each late filing. Okay, and you've got a fixed penalty of £200 when the threshold is reached. The level of point you get is dependent on the frequency of your submission. So if it's annually, it's two points. If it's quarterly, it's four points. If it's monthly, it's five points. You can reset your points <laughs> if at any time you meet a couple of conditions. The submission of the returns on or before the due date for the period of time based on their submission frequency, all returns that were due within the preceding 24 months have been received. This one is complex. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got interest harmonization. Okay, they're looking to align the VAT interest rules with the income tax self assessment rules. And again, we've got some changes coming in on the 1st of April 2022. So now we've got late payment interest, LPI. That's going to be charged from the date that tax becomes overdue until the date the payment is received. And then you've got VAT repayment supplements going to be repaid, uh, replaced with something called VAT repayment interest. Now, repayment supplement is something that HMRC have wanted to get rid of for a long time because it's fixed at 5%. They take more than 30 days to give you your money back in terms of your VAT return and incur 5% penalty. So, hallelujah for revenue. They're getting rid of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Repayment interest will be paid from the later of the due date of the return, the date the return is submitted. Down the bottom there, I've put down what the interest rates are. So, late payment interest is 2.5% plus the Bank of England base rate. The repayment interest is Bank of England interest rate less 1%. So you're probably going to be paying revenue at this rate. Subject uh, <laughs> to a minimum of 0.5%. Okay, so that's the, the, new uh, the new penalty regime. Very, very briefly explained. General comments on it. Well, I, I, think, I think overall reading them, I think we're probably going to end up with lower penalties. So it might be good news. However, they are complex, and I think revenue have recognised they're complex because with the late payment penalty, 
they've introduced something called a period of familiarization. Okay. No late penalty in the first year up to 31st of March 2023 if payment is made in full within 30 days of the due date. However, you're still going to incur interest. Revenue have got a discretion not to apply a point or a penalty. So it'd be interesting to see how that evolves, how they're going to apply their discretion. And again, as I've said, taxpayers can challenge the point or penalty through either revenue. You can ask for a local review uh, or the first tier tribunal. So we've got a whole new area of penalties to get to grips with. Um, as I say, I think overall, probably going to result in less penalties. Uh, where we could start to get unstuck is if we go back to the days of taxpayers using the VAT uh, to, to cash flow their own businesses, because the penalties have been reduced to such a low level where taxpayers start, start to take advantage again and revenue throw their toys out. Okay, so keep an eye on it. Well, I've got one minute, so I'm not doing too badly before this thing self exterminates. <laughs> Simplifying the land exemption. Okay. Again, just something to keep an eye on, but there was a call for evidence back in May 2021 um, where what Revenue wants to try and do is to simplify the rules around the option to tax and the VAT liability <coughs> of land. Uh, the Office for Tax Simplification back in 2017 rejected three of the original. Um, proposals, which was removing the ability to opt and making all transactions exempt, removing the option to tax and making all land and property transactions subject to a reduced rate, or turning things around in their head completely, making all supplies taxable with an option to exempt. And those three things were rejected by the, uh, the Office of Tax Simplification. However, Revenue said they're going to reconsider them, look at them again. But in addition to that, they've also added another three bullet points. Okay, simplifying VAT on land by making most supplies subject to VAT, except specific supplies. So I think it would be interesting if they were to propose that, what that means for the uh, residential and charity sector, will be part of the uh, exempting provisions. Simplifying VAT on land by defining short term or minor interests and making them liable to that. I think this is where we're moving into the realms of what is a license to occupy and what is the use of facilities. And quite clearly, I think that's why they're, they're holding on to my hostel case. <laughs> um, but you know, I think that's another area they're looking at. And then an interesting one right at the bottom, one of the proposals they've got is to link the VAT liability to the land registry office. Okay, so if you've got some land or buildings that's registered with the land registry, it's exempt. If it's not registered with the land registry, it's taxable. I don't know how that's going to work, but again, that's one of the proposals they're looking at. So one to keep an eye on. Uh, <laughs> given the way revenue are currently operating, I would expect slow progress, but nevertheless, it's a big area. Right, I've reached four o'clock. So questions or do we want to do it over a glass of wine?